Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about the Sabbath, and and really the thing that I love about this story is that it's counter to what we think. And when I say it's counter to what we think, is that the Sabbath is all about rules, except it's not about rules. And that's what I want to share with you tonight. And so this is where the Sabbath story first, first starts. And it's in the Garden of Eden, and it's after God gets done creating everything. So this is Genesis 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Okay, I'm sure you guys have read this many times. But let me put some emphasis on the words for you, because this will help. Thus, the heavens and the earth and the, all the hosts of them were finished. Work was done. And on the seventh day, watch this, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Now why do I say it that way? Notice this was the seventh day. Why was it the seventh day? Because this was the end, right? He had done everything. Was Adam around on the seventh day? He was, right? Adam was created the day before, right? Adam was here. Is there any mention of Adam in this passage? There is zero mention of Adam in this passage. This all talks about God. What God did, God finished his work. He did it all and he rested. Doesn't say anything to Adam. When is the next time that we see the Sabbath mentioned? 2,000 years later. 2,000 years later, God brings up the Sabbath. So Adam and all his children and all the stuff really up until Moses don't even know what the Sabbath is. Let me show you where the Sabbath starts. Okay, that was, the, that was the beginning as far as God was concerned. This is the first time that God talks to man about the Sabbath. And this is in Exodus 16, verse 22. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. What this is about is they were told, that the, the Israelites were told that you, for six days, God's going to provide the manna that you eat. This is in the wilderness. and But on the sixth day, you, you're to collect twice as much for the Sabbath. In other words, you collect an extra day's worth on the Saturday so that on the Sunday, you do no work. And this is what this verse is. Uh, uh, this is where we're jumping into this verse. It says, then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourself all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So he's saying, go and get everything you need to get on the sixth day. You won't see it tomorrow. It will not show up tomorrow because this is the Lord's day. It's the Sabbath day. It's the rest day. Get twice as much today. But as always, you know, unbelief. Verse 27. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. In other words, God's saying, why won't you trust me? I've told you that I'm going to provide for you on day six for an extra day. Why won't you trust me? Why are you going out looking for food in the fields? You think that if, I can give it, if I'm going to give it to you for six days in a row, that I'm going to let you go hungry on the seventh? That's what these people's actions were saying. God, we don't trust you. 
because on the seventh day, it may not be there. So these guys went out there. And in order to show them, this is how good God is. Okay, Not only does he provide the food, he provides the food for them. He provides it daily and it's fresh. But he, you know, most people would say, well, well why, did the, why did the bread go moldy if they, if they gathered too much? It's because God wanted them to live by faith, wanted them to live by trust in him. And the way you do that is you don't store up for the next day, because if you're storing up for next day, you're saying, God, I don't trust you to provide. And this is a spiritual principle for us as well. Some of us would like God to just shower us with money so we'd never have to worry about money again. He'd like us to shower us with whatever it is so that we never have to, to trust him again. But you know what? That's not the way that God operates. He can give you as much money as you want, but God knows your heart. And ultimately, we need to have money, but money should not have us. And that's a huge distinction. And for many people, the reason why you're not awash in, in finances, and there's spiritual principles, and I won't teach on that tonight, but the spiritual principles why you are not getting the finances that you'd like to get. But one of the reasons is because God knows that if you were to get so much money, you would stop trusting him. It would become about the money and not the Lord. And the Lord doesn't want you trading your relationship with him for comfort. That is not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about relationship and trust. And, and this is what uh, the Israelites were showing God at this time, that they did not trust him. Mind you, this was after the food appeared supernaturally. This was after they passed through the Red Sea. This is after all the plagues in Egypt. This is after the Passover. I mean, this is after all that stuff, right? It's not like these guys, this was the first thing that ever happened. They had plenty of opportunities to trust God. But even in this, even in a basic thing of them going hungry for one day, they didn't trust God. And God is so good that he's showing them that he's with them because the bread goes moldy if they take too much. That shows them that it's, he's given them guardrails or guides on which to go so that they, they learn the lesson. Otherwise, you could just let them gather whatever and just say, whatever, you know, who cares? Just let them gather as much as they want. I'll be displeased, but, you know, but God's like, no, I, I want their heart. I want them to see what the purpose of this is. Okay. So again, keep in mind, God was the, the initial institutor of the Sabbath. And then he doesn't say anything to the Jews for 2,000 years. The next time we hear about the Sabbath is Exodus 20. And we'll go there now. It says, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, made it holy. Look where this is. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is one of the Ten Commandments. It's number eight in the Ten Commandments. So this is how important the Sabbath was to God. That out of, you know, I mean, there was 613 different rules or laws that he gave the, the Israelites, but he had kind of like his top 10, you know, the top, top hits, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the top uh, uh, commandments. And this is number eight. It's one of the important ones. In fact, he mentions this before he even gets into murder and adultery and stealing and anything else, right? The Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. So understand the mindset of these people was you don't do anything on the Sabbath. And for those of you that, that live or, or work in or, or have passed through, um, you know, Jewish communities in Melbourne, we have a, a Jewish community uh, in and around uh, the city in Caulfield and Balaclava and places like that. And you will see that they're typically the Orthodox Jews, they're dressed up in their, uh, in their gear and they wear, they've got the hats and you'll see them with the, uh, with the large, you know, the long sideburns. And, and they've got certain things in their home to account for the Sabbath. So, for example, in these areas, you know, when you push the button to, to get the light to turn, uh, the light to change so you can walk, walk past you know, on a crossing, these are automated in those areas. So when they're walking around on the Saturday, on the Sabbath, they don't press the button because if they press the button, that's doing work. And that goes against the Sabbath. So, so all of these will happen automatically. They've got timers in their house for the lights so they don't have to flick the light switch. Their oven will turn on at a certain time. They'll put food from the night before and the oven will turn on and cook and do all those things because they can't, they can't touch it. Anything that's considered work. So for them, they, 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 they're keeping the Sabbath still. And this is where God has instituted these things. And, and it's a big deal to God, right? And we know it's a big deal to God because we're going to see what happens when people don't follow the Sabbath. 
And then we see here in Exodus 31, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of, the, of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. This is when he got the Ten Commandments. And it was the original one where God wrote it with his own finger. So fair to say that there was a pretty big emphasis on the Sabbath and the consequences for messing up on the Sabbath were quite serious. So let's see the first example of someone. This is in, uh, uh, in Numbers uh, and it's in Numbers uh, 15 uh, verse 32. Now, while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under a guard because it had not been explained what should be done with him. Then the Lord said to Moses, watch this, the Lord said to Moses, the man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with the stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones and he died. So let's think about this. You've got God telling them that they have to follow the Sabbath. They violate the first Sabbath, right, by going and picking up food. So God says, you're not even allowed to leave your house. So forget food. Up until now, it was like, you know, just the, the food bit. Now he's saying, you're not even allowed to leave your house. And, and now this guy is going and picking up sticks. The reason he went to pick up sticks is because he wanted to make a fire. And, and you know, making fire on the Sabbath is work, right? It's not like we have today where you can just turn the oven on, right? They had to gather sticks in order to make fire, in order to cook food. And this guy was found picking up sticks. And just for that, and when I say just, I mean, just from our opinion, obviously it mattered to God. He was put to death. He was stoned. And so think about this mentality, okay, that these guys had. The Israelites now have gone for 2,000 years terrified of messing up on the Sabbath. So picture this, 2,000 years, nothing in the Sabbath. God says it when he finishes his work. He doesn't say anything to Adam about it. Adam is not aware of the Sabbath. He is not asked to keep the Sabbath. 2,000 years, Adam and all his descendants, Sabbath is not a thing. Then the Israelites come out of Egypt. They're given the law, Mount Sinai, and now they live with the Sabbath. And you can see the seriousness of the Sabbath, and you can see the consequences of, 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 of messing up on the Sabbath. And they live with this for 2,000 years. And here's what happens next. Matthew 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And we can go over to Luke 6 and read exactly the same story. And I like to read these, you know, when you read the Gospels, oftentimes the story is repeated multiple times. And it's great to read it because you get different angles. Um, this is in Luke 6, verse 1. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields. This is Jesus. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. He's pointing out the rubbing because that's work. And some of the Pharisees said to them, 
Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answered them, said, Jesus answering them said, have you not even read this? When the, uh, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any, but for the priest to eat. And he said to them, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, let me pause there for a minute and get you to think about something. What did the Pharisees say to Jesus? Why do you do and why do your disciples do what is unlawful? Were they wrong in their accusation of Jesus? Was Jesus doing something unlawful? People are worried. I don't know. I want to say that. I want to accuse Jesus of doing something unlawful. Jesus was doing something unlawful. Jesus did not rebuke them. He did not say that this is unlawful. Based on what we've just read in the law of Moses, given by God himself with his own finger in the Ten Commandments, God said, anybody that works on the Sabbath shall be put to death. And here is Jesus working on the Sabbath. Think about this. How many of us have made up our own rules in our mind? And then if Jesus was to come along, you would tell him he's wrong. What doctrines do we have in the church that say we have to do things a certain way? And we have typically less evidence for it than what the Israelites did at this point and what the Pharisees did. Because the Pharisees could point to the, to, the, to the law and say, God gave us this. We can show you. God gave us this. It's part of the Ten Commandments. He wrote it with his own finger. And we've been putting people to death for 2,000 years for doing what you just did. And yet Jesus' response was, it's okay. So think about this, right? Most people look at this and just hear the story and go, well, you know, it wasn't a big deal. It was just grain. No, it, this was a huge deal. He was a man, flesh and blood, telling the Pharisees, these were the people, these were the, 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 the pastors and priests and religious leaders of their day saying that he, he is more important than the law given by God. That is a massive statement. That's a huge statement for him to make. And it would have upset them big time because he's saying, I am more important than what God has told you before. Me. That is huge. How many people would have the courage to do that, knowing that the first guy who picked up sticks and got put to death? Right? I reckon that his disciples that were with him were just a little bit uncomfortable. You know, they were hoping that Jesus had a really good way out because otherwise it would have been terrifying for them because they knew they all lived under the law. Okay. Let's keep going. We'll go back to, um, uh, and, and I like reading it in, in these two, because if you see Matthew actually gives a much broader explanation than Luke does. Uh, I'll read it here and then I'll go back here. Let's go back into uh, 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 the, the next part of this story. Verse uh, six, uh, Luke six, verse six. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. And we can, um, we can pick up the same story over here uh, in Matthew. Verse 9. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Did they care about the Sabbath? No. Have a look why. They asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? They were looking for ways to trap Jesus. I don't think that this man with the withered hand was there by accident. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value then 
is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. It's interesting to me that the Pharisees were so zealous about the Sabbath and completely missed the point of it. In their mind, the purpose of the Sabbath was to keep the rule. In their mind, God said, no work. No work. But this is where you can see that they've missed it. Rewind over here to, to, to chapter 12 in verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And what Jesus is referring to here is this verses uh, in the Old Testament that talks about uh, the God instituted sacrifice. Okay, so when people did the wrong thing, they would have to sacrifice an animal uh, in order to atone for their sins. But the reason they did that was because it was, you know, they messed up. But what the Jews had figured out is, all right, if I do this, here is the sacrifice. So they would sin habitually and then go and get their goat or their sheep or their turtle dove or whatever in order to sacrifice it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't want the sacrifice. He doesn't want the sacrifice. You know, God says in other parts that the, the, the sacrifices were like a stink in his nostrils. And yet God was the one that instituted sacrifice and burnt offering. He was the one that requested it. He said, if you do this, burn animals. Do You know, it, it was all a God instituted thing. And then it became a stink in his nostrils. Why? Does the, does the smell of meat smell different over time? No, it's the same smell. But what God wanted was their hearts. God wasn't after their actions. It, it, the whole idea behind it was, if you mess up, fess up, right? And fessing up meant bringing an animal and sacrificing it. It was supposed to cost you something because you didn't bring the, the, the rubbish animal. You brought the spotless one, right? This was also an allegory towards Jesus because Jesus was the, the spotless, blameless lamb. But, but it, was, it, was, it was meant to cost them something, number one. And number two, it was meant to remind them that they'd done wrong because this animal now, you know, that's where we get the word scapegoat from. If you ever heard the term scapegoat, where that, what it actually is, it's, it's an escape goat. And it's basically where the, the goat would have the sin of the sinner put on them. And then the, the goat would be killed by the priest. And so the escape for the sin was in the goat. And so Jesus is our scapegoat, if you think about it in that way, right? Jesus was there to take our punishment for us. And so what people didn't understand is that God's heart behind the Sabbath had zero to do with the actions of the Sabbath and everything to do with the heart. The reason why God wanted the Israelites to keep the Sabbath was twofold. Number one, it was about trust. It was about him showing them that I'm going to provide for your rest. This is how good God is, right? And this is why I say this, 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 this teaching isn't about the Sabbath. The Sabbath's the subject, but it's not about the Sabbath. It's about understanding the character of God. God says to them, I'm so good, I'm going to give you a day of rest. And guess what? I'm not just going to give you a day of rest. I'm going to provide for you in your day of rest so that your day of rest doesn't even cost you anything. It's a free day. I'm going to provide extra food for you on the sixth day so that you don't have to go and do anything extra. You can enjoy the day, right? Think about it. for us, if we're working, we go and say, what? I want to take a holiday. So what am I going to do? I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to accrue my annual leave. And then I'm going to take a break at the end of the year once I've earned it, right? And God's saying, you don't need to earn it. I'm going to give you a day off a week, every week. And on top of that, I'm even going to give you food and I'm going to look after you. It's going to cost you nothing for you to rest. And yet humanity's mindset is, I'm not going to trust God. I'm going to go and try and earn it by getting extra food for myself. And so they missed the point. The other reason for the Sabbath was because God wanted to institute a covenant with Israel. And it was there to be between them and God so that he could show them what he was and what he was about and to give them a different perspective. And you can see this here in Exodus 20. Uh, no, where is it? It might have been in 16. Uh, yeah. So uh, here we go in uh, Exodus 31, sorry. Verse 15, work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. 
Whoever does any work on the Sabbath, they shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Watch this. What's the purpose of it? It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. In other words, this was, you know, God used symbols in the Old Testament to set the Israelites apart from all the other tribes and all the other nations. That's why Abraham had to be circumcised. The Israelites were circumcised so that people knew, hey, these were different people. Why were they different? They were circumcised. They kept certain rituals. They did certain things that other tribes didn't do. God told them, separate yourselves. And so one of the ways in which people knew that the Israelites were different was because of these physical or outward mannerisms. It's why you'll see the Orthodox Jews wearing what they wear, because in their mind, that's how they honor God. Right? In their mind, they need to be set apart. They need to look different. They, you know, they can't do certain things. And so for many Christians, the Sabbath has become a ritual and a rule. You can't heal on the Sabbath. What does that mean? That means that on Sunday, they will do certain things and not other things. On Sunday is the Lord's Day. But what do you do the other six days? What is your mindset the other six? Can you do whatever you want the other six? Because you're keeping the Sabbath. Right? Whole religions have been made out of the Sabbath. That's how we got the, the Seventh-day Adventists. And it's these sorts of rules. You see, you see the, this is why Jesus was angry at the Pharisees. This man sitting there with a withered hand and their heart is 100% to do with the law and did you follow the rules and nothing to do with what the Sabbath was created for, which was rest for man. Healing for that man with the withered hand was rest for him. And they were withholding rest for him in order to uphold the rules. And Jesus was saying to them, you have completely missed it. If you would have known that, that I desire mercy and not sacrifice, if you had known that my heart as God is to save you, to set you free, to give you rest, then you would have entered into it. But because of your rule following and your hardness of heart, you've completely missed it. And just to rub salt in the wounds, to prove to them that he's right, you know what Jesus does? He heals on the Sabbath. Now, let me ask you this. When he was doing the grains, you know, rubbing the grains in his hands or, or, or in his, his, um, his disciples were doing that, you could have said, that's Jesus, that's the disciples, he's evil, he's doing the wrong thing, he's breaking the law, okay? And you could argue that point, and they would have probably argued that point. Why do you think Jesus healed the man, other than obviously having compassion for the man? The reason why Jesus healed the man is because for someone to be healed, God had to be involved. It had to be God's power involved for that man's hand to be healed. So what does the act of Jesus healing this man show you and show them that Jesus is right? Because they could have said, well, you know, you, you've got your own strength. You can, you can rub, you know, you can rub things in your hands and make it happen. And, 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 and that's fine. That's on you. But now when this guy gets healed in the synagogue of all places, they're probably expecting God to like, you know, strike Jesus down with lightning or something. Right. But the fact that God intervened and healed this man showed that God was on Jesus' side and not their side. It's amazing to me what the, how tense that situation would have been. And look at their response afterwards. It wasn't wonder and amazement. It wasn't like, oh, my goodness, this is, I mean, what do we do with this, right? Because we know that God told us to do this, but you're telling us this other thing, and we see God's power manifest. How does this work? And their heart was, how can we kill him, <laughs> right? They're looking for ways to kill him. They've just seen a miracle. And their response is, how do we kill him? And sad to say that in, in, in our modern kind of church, there's a lot of this stuff going on. Someone will come in and worship slightly different to us and people will criticize. Someone will have a slightly different belief or, you know, maybe they're into, you know, they're into praying a certain way or singing a certain way. Well, that can't be of the Lord. Maybe that, you know, I, I come from a church. I grew up in a, a very conservative Baptist church, right? The women sat on one side, the man sat on one side. The, the, the men had to wear suits to church. I mean, you, if you wore jeans to church, like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, if you spoke, if it was louder than a whisper, the Holy Spirit would freak out and run out of the room. Like, I mean, the Holy Spirit gets spooked by loud noises in, in that church. You know, the women would, would sit separate to the men and the women would have to have their heads covered. 
because, you know, they picked this obscure verse from the Old Testament where the angels have problems seeing women's hair. And so, well, you know, we've got to cover up. But then, you know, the law creeps in over time. So then you'll see women that are fully covered. And then you'll see the ones that have just the headband. You know, it's like you still see like 80% of their hair, but they're covered, right? They're just following the law, right? They're just, they're not, the heart of the law is the heart of the law. And the heart of the law is not the action they're doing. I'm not criticizing people. I'm just, I'm using this as an example. You know, they're doing what the Jews did, which is like, well, I know I need to be covered up, but I just... I just did my hair and it looks fantastic and I want to show it off at church. So how do I appease God and make myself look good? I'm going to wear a headband. It's like, that's, you missed the point. You know, either you cover your hair or you don't, you know? And so we've made all these rules. Now we won't call it the Sabbath. We'll call it something else. But in our heart, we have our own rules that we've made and we say, okay, we're willing to do this, but we're not willing to do that. And this is what holds us back in our beliefs, right? And, and we forget the heart behind what God came here to do. We forget the heart behind salvation. We say to someone, look, if you're a sinner, God can, God can restore you. That person gets born again and now you tell them, okay, straighten up and fly right now. You're a Christian. You can't live this way anymore. You can't go on sinning. You can't make a mistake now. You can't, what, you get a tattoo? Well, I mean, come on. You know, your, your ears pierced, you know, right? Everyone's got different laws. For some people, it's here. For some people, it's here. For some people, if you drink, you're going to hell. Other people, drinking's fine. You just can't smoke. Other people can smoke and can drink, but they can't go dancing, right? We've made our own Sabbaths. And, and this is why all these different denominations exist. It's this concept of the way that I worship is correct. But my Bible doesn't have denominations in it. Jesus didn't tell people. In fact, Jesus was against it. If you look, some people were following Peter and they said, you know, I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos, I'm of, you know, and so on. And, and, and it's like, that's not what this is about. The kingdom is about how we love each other. It says, you know, the same way that the Jews were set apart, people knew that the Jews were Jews because they were circumcised and they had all these other different mannerisms and things they did. What does Jesus say, say about us? How will people know that we are his disciples? by the division that we have amongst our churches and denominations. It's true. That's not what he said, but that's what we're doing. Because like I said, when I try to rent this venue, you know what question I kept getting asked? What denomination are you? That's how the world knows us. What denomination are you? I said, I'm not non-denominational. He goes, well, what's that? I said, well, I just believe the Bible. <laughs> Because well, what do you mean? I said, well, we're not a specific denomination. Like we don't have a specific set of rules. We just read the Bible and we do that. It, it didn't make sense to him. He wanted to pigeonhole us and say, okay, you're this type or you're that type. But why do people, why do non-believers see us that way? Because that's the way we are as a church. And that's not what God intended. Now I'm not against anyone. I'm not saying that people are bad for believing what they believe, but I'm saying that these are the types of beliefs that lead us to those places where the, where the God of the universe is standing in front of you and you are so rigid in your rules and wanting to follow your rules that you completely miss Jesus. They missed God in their midst because the rules are more important. And so my challenge to you tonight is where are you missing God in your life? Where is God trying to show you something and your rules, your mindset, your view of how things should be are getting in the way of that? Because these Pharisees completely missed it. And yet, could you argue with them? I mean, their job was to keep the law. They took pride in this. And the law was the law. I mean, God was the one that instituted it. It wasn't even their law. But Jesus is showing them that they missed the point. They missed the point. Now, you might say, well, okay, well, that was the Pharisees and that was Jesus. But, you know, I mean, is that the way that, you know, the people lived after that? What was their understanding? Let me show you what their understanding was in the end, when all was said and done, I'm going uh, to show you these verses. And this will put it to rest. And this is in Colossians 2, verse 11. And I'm going to put some emphasis on this. It says, in him, in who him? In Jesus. You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So first thing, what is this saying? In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. What's he saying? You're not circumcised, right? 
your circumcision is made without hands. In other words, you are not physically circumcised, but you are considered circumcised because you are in him. Because circumcision is not about cutting off foreskin. It's about being separated and set apart for God. And when you're a believer, when you're in Jesus, that is what you are doing. You are circumcised because your heart is circumcised. There was no need to be circumcised as a man if you're in Christ. The need to be circumcised was part of the law, and it was there for a season and for a time. The Sabbath, right? Look at the Seventh-day Adventists walking around making a Sabbath. The Sabbath's not even for them. We read before in Exodus, the Sabbath was a covenant between God and the Israelites. It was not a covenant between God and anybody else. So if you're not an Israelite and you're, you're sitting here running around saying, I've got to keep the Sabbath, it's not even for you. It's not even a law for you. It's got nothing to do with you. It was never meant for you. Okay. Circumcision was not meant for you. If you're circumcised, good for you. It's not, uh, it's not good or bad. It's, it, it's, it, it's become a thing in our society that people do. Many Christians will get circumcised because they read the Bible and they go, we've got to get circumcised. But this is saying that we're circumcised without hands. So he does away with circumcision. Let's read on verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him. In other words, you're dead in your trespasses and you're uncircumcised and he's made you alive together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. What was the handwriting of requirements that was against us? Let me stop the share for a second because this is a big moment. What was the handwriting of requirements? We read it earlier. What did God do? God wrote his 10 commandments with his finger. Who's living today by the 10 commandments? Who at least thinks that it's just good to follow them? You know, maybe we don't have to necessarily do them, but it's, it's a good thing. It's, I mean, you shouldn't murder. You shouldn't. What Sabbaths are you following? Look what this says. It's important. Okay. You can read your Bible if you don't trust mine. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was for us. No, that was against us. It says that the law was the strength of sin, right? You can read that. Uh, in other parts of the New Testament, talks about the law and explains the purpose of the law. The handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. People are sitting here trying to live by the Sabbath, trying to live by the Ten Commandments, but this law was against us and was contrary to us. And look what it says. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What did he take out of the way and nailed it to the cross? Well, what we just read. The handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. What are these principalities and powers? And people talk about, well, it's Satan and the demons. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. And, and there, there is a there is a there is a, 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 a side to that. But let's just read the text again. Look at what the text is saying. He's just made a statement. He's made a statement that he says uh, from verse 13, and, and please focus, catch this, right? This is important. And you, talking about you as a non-believer, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, now you're a believer, so he's made you alive with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. And now in that act of being born again, he has wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us. Watch this. And... He has taken it out of the way. What's the it? The it is this, the handwriting of requirements, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. What principalities and powers? Well, think about it. What empowered sin? It was the law. The law empowered sin. So what is he disarming? He's disarming the law. He's disarming the power, the strength of the law, because look at the verse, look at the, the, the sentence just before. He nailed it to the cross and he did away with it. He took away the strength that was in the law to empower sin, and he triumphed over them in it. 
And so what's the conclusion out of all of this, right? Because you might say, well, Rudy, you're misinterpreting. That's not quite what was said. Okay, let's keep reading and let's see what the conclusion is. Number six, verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So let no one judge you in food or drink. How many people have been told you can't eat that? Don't eat pork. That's unholy. Right? How many people don't eat pork? I know Christians that don't eat pork. Not because they don't like pork, because bacon is delicious. I don't care what you say, right? But they don't eat pork because they think that somehow they're going to be more spiritual, or they don't drink alcohol, or they don't drink other things, or they won't eat shelf. It doesn't matter. It's something, right? But it's not that they don't drink it because they think there's something wrong with it, but they think that somehow they're going to please God. And this is saying, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. You see how this is all in the same thing? We've got chapter and verse, but this is all in one letter. He's showing you that when you're in Christ, you have freedom. You're, you're not even under this stuff. You're not even meant to live this way. And yet we, we have created so many Sabbaths in our life, so many rules and regulations, and we have no freedom in our walk with Christ. And we're supposed to be free. Jesus said that he gives us freedom. He gives us rest says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The, the truth on its own doesn't set you free. You have to know the truth. And then you got to mix it with faith. There's a plug, right? But it's true. you got to mix it with faith. So many people know the truth and they don't mix it with faith. They go, well, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to live this way because it's just safer. Is it safer? Because following the law leads to death. It doesn't lead to life. Following the law is not going to give you freedom. And unfortunately, many people think that if they follow the law at least just a little bit, they can, they can hopefully make up for any gaps. But the minute that you try and make up for gaps in what Jesus did for you on the cross, you're on really, really thin ice. I'd call it no ice, right? Because the minute you try and say that it's Jesus plus your work, now you're in trouble. Because now what you're saying is the blood of Jesus is not enough. Verses like this should rock your world and set you free. If you've understood what I've said and you've read this and you mix it with faith, this should set you free. If you are in Christ, if you are a born again, New Testament believer, you should be free to serve God without all of these requirements. You should not be looking at the Old Testament and taking that burden on yourself. Number one, it was never meant for you. The law was given to the Jews. It was never given to the Gentiles. If you are not a Jew, you have no business talking about the law. That's the first thing. The second thing is, Jesus did away with it. You can see here, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. In other words, his death, burial, and resurrection, put that to the side. So even for the Jews, if you're a born-again believer and you're a Jew, you don't need to be following these rules. What was the purpose of these rules? It tells us here in verse 17, these things are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And for most people, sadly, they have missed the heart essence of the gospel. And they've made the gospel all about rules and regulations of do's and don'ts of I can do this, but I can't do that. I have, to, you know, when I was growing up, I remember um, I was taught to pray. And the way I was taught to pray is that I would have to have be on my knees and have my head all the way down. You know, kind of how Muslims do their prayers, how they kind of go down. But I don't like I'd be staying like that, right, with my hands in my And because I was told that that's how you pray. And I said, but, but why? And this is how it was explained to me. You know, Rudy, if you're sitting with someone and um, they're, they're, they're a large CEO of a, a corporation or they're a prime minister or president, how would you sit if you're talking to them? Would you not sit upright and, and in a respectful manner? And I said, yeah, of course, you know. Well, imagine if it's the God of the universe, how would you sit? And the way you would sit is you'd be, you know, I mean, you look in the, you look in the Bible, whenever an angel would turn up, people would just fall to the ground. You know, they were terrified. You know, they'd bow their heads to the ground. And so that's the way that I was taught to pray. And I was told that if I don't pray that way, it's not respectful to God. That was a Sabbath in my life for many years until I realized that God doesn't care how I sit. It's, it's the condition of my heart. I can sit sideways, upside down. I can be on my belly with my head in the dirt and not love God. God looks at the heart because he desires mercy, not sacrifice. Right? God is looking for the heart. God is not looking for you to have the outward appearance of being holy. God is looking for you to be holy inside. And the way that you're holy inside is by having a relationship with him and understanding what Jesus did for us. And for many Christians, if you look around, we have made an industry out of all the rules and regulations when Jesus came to bring us freedom. 
It was for freedom that we were made free. And yet, many Christians have more burdens on them today than non-believers. Because non-believers don't expect to do anything. They don't know anything. But Christians, you know, they, they, they were fine before. I mean, they were unhappy, but, but they were fine in this respect. Now that they've come into the church, now we stack a whole bunch of rules on top of them. We tell them, okay, great. Now you're born again. Now you have to do this, 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 and this. And that's not the heart of God. Now, does that mean that we don't have responsibility? Of course we have responsibility. And we'll talk about grace and sin and all that stuff another time. But the purpose of this is for you to really think about it. What are the areas of your life where you have set up rules and regulations that are contrary to what Jesus came to do? What are the areas where you're judging others in food and drink and new moons and Sabbaths? Is it that person that comes in wearing something that you wouldn't wear and you think, well, you know, you can't be a Christian. Because what that's doing is it's taking the focus of what Jesus did for us. And it goes the other way around as well. You know, you might see someone doing things that you don't agree with. You don't have to follow them. But just understand that, you know, we're here to worship God as a corporate body. And, and, and our heart is to see unity in the body of Christ, not division. Because it says that you will know them by the love that they have one for another. And that's why I love being part of a group like this. Because we can share genuine love one for another. Even though we might be separated by distance. But the fact that we can come together regularly and see each other's faces, that's, that's a great thing about Zoom. If this was just a phone call, it wouldn't be the same. You know, and it's just... It's, it's, it's imperfect, but it's great compared to the alternative. And, and this is what it is. You know, I would love to see people in this group support each other and have breakaway groups where they, you know, they get together maybe on a Wednesday night or a Friday night and they just pray together and they just share with one another. I would encourage you to do that through the chat function. You can reach out to other people in the group privately. You just pick their name and, and you can send them a private message. You say, hey, you're in WA, we're in WA. You know, let's, you know, not do daylight savings together, you know. Or whatever it is that the people in WA do, you know? So the point I'm making is look for ways to connect with other people. But just remember that God's heart is for unity. And Jesus came to bring us all together. And this is just a prime example of how most Christians, number one, have no idea how the Sabbath came about, have no idea that God's intent was never for us to have a Sabbath. Because he didn't even talk to Adam about it. I mean, Adam was right there. He could have talked to Adam about it. He didn't want us to worry about the Sabbath. And yet, even within the Sabbath and the harshness of the rules, that's what people think about. People hear Sabbath and they go, oh, look how harsh it was. Even within the Sabbath, there was grace and mercy and love. It was, I want to give you rest. Yeah, nincompoops, I want to give you rest. And I'm going to even provide for you during the rest. So it cost you nothing to rest. And they were like, no, nope, we don't want it. You know, We want to work for our rest. And sad to say, Christians today, that's what they're doing. They're finding ways to work for their rest. And instead of just accepting what God did for us, what Jesus did for us on the cross, so we could benefit from all those things that God has provided, we're still trying to work for our salvation. We're still trying to work for our healing. We're still trying to work for our prosperity. And this is the journey that we're going on, brothers and sisters. And what I've said to you from the start, you need to know why you believe what you believe. If you believe you're supposed to keep the Sabbath, hopefully tonight you've understood that you don't need to. But I guarantee you, there's at least one person in this room who didn't raise their hand who at least thought that there's some benefits to keeping it. And I'm not saying that there isn't benefits to sitting there and, and, and focusing on the Lord and all that. There is, absolutely. But it shouldn't be a religious thing. It shouldn't be something you do because you feel like God's going to be pleased if you do it. And so as we debunk these different myths along the way, it'll strengthen your faith in God. It'll show you the goodness of God, even in the midst of something as simple as you pick up sticks, you die. That's not the heart behind it. And more importantly, that God is good all the time. And you see God's initial plan for redemption and initial plan for what he wanted us to, to, to live like. And that's he wanted to give us rest. And man struggles with that because we're so performance oriented. And as you start to go on this journey and you let Jesus in more and more, you let him do the stuff for you that he came to do, you're going to feel at peace. You're going to feel rested. So don't fight God. He's a good God. You don't need to go out on the seventh day. He's already provided for you on the sixth day. And you can look to God for that because that's, that's who he is. And God doesn't just provide for us one day. God provides for us every day. You know? And trusting God is really about letting go. You've heard the, the verses. You've heard the story. Now you have to mix it with faith and walk that out. And so I encourage you that if there are things tonight, you know, I'm going to pray uh, before I close this off uh, uh, and we go to Q&A, but but I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal for you the areas where you've created your own Sabbaths, your own roadblocks, your own areas in your mind. And I just pray the Holy Spirit will reveal those to you and that then you'll be able to overcome those 
by using what you've heard tonight. So, Father, we just thank you for this revelation. We thank you, Father, that you've given people a fresh perspective. Holy Spirit, I ask you to just speak to everybody's heart right now, to show them the areas where maybe they've allowed these rules and regulations to seep in and just to take away from the wonder and the, the grace of Jesus, of what he did for us on the cross. And Holy Spirit, just help them overcome those areas. These may be things that they've believed their whole life. They've, they've Well-meaning people have told them. But Father, help them through the truth of the word and the revelation that they've received to step over into your grace, into your mercy, into your goodness, so they can enjoy the fullness of who you are and what you did for them on the cross. And so we just thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your mercy. And we thank you that by love, we can receive. We know that faith works by love. So by, by your love, by understanding your love for us, and by what you did on the cross, we can receive all the things that you paid such a heavy price for. And that we don't need to work for those things. We just need to receive them by faith. So we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.